And hello and welcome to our time. What effect does Asperger's syndrome have on an individual? Well, we'll be talking about that later in the show. And are you a lover of the blues? And frankly, what constitutes as the blues in 2022? Well, to explain more and to continue the education of young blues musicians, here are Evan Wetter and Erica Graff. Welcome to our time. Thank you, Thank Malcolm. You, Malcolm. I love here. what you do because you play organ. Correct. Now, what type of organ is it? It's a Hammond organ. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And it reverberates and yeah. <laughs> it feels like it's alive, a moving thing. I often think it's like the TARDIS or it's like one of the... Um, uh, exterminate, exterminate, yeah, yeah. coming towards you <laughs> as you're yeah, playing it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's the right technology, right? It's it's the 1960s and uh, how fantastic to be able to still be touring around the country and, and, and playing one of these beautiful organs. Yes. And what do you play? I play guitar in the band and... Uh I love, love playing the blues. <laughs> and, and talking about the band, yeah. we're talking about your band, which yeah. is? Lazy Eye. And where did the name come from, as if I don't know, but you need to explain. <laughs> well, it's great, yeah. It's not, we don't have a Lazy Eye. Uh, no. But there, it, there was actually um, a, a record store in, in Rundle Street. Um, here in South many, Australia. Here in South Australia, mm -hmm. many years ago. And uh, a good friend of ours, Mr. Crystal wrote a song called Lazy Eye for a gentleman who actually uh, worked at the store. Did he have a lazy eye? He did. And uh, you know what? We were trying to um, to come up with a name for the band. We, we had an opportunity for one of our first performers to uh, to play with Smoke and Joe Robinson. Right. And, and we're like, oh, oh gosh, we haven't even got a name. You know, and I'd <laughs> just been listening to this, this record and, and I just said, well, why don't we just, for now, why don't we just call it Lazy Eye? And it's a great it, name. No, it's a really great name because it's so <laughs> easy to pick up and remember, quite frankly. Mm. Um, but it's sort of got a bluesy feel about it for some reason. It has, and it's always interesting when, when you're speaking to someone and say, oh, hi, it's, it's Evan from Lazy Eye. And they're like, uh, who? From, yes. from where? <laughs> is, is that a glasses <laughs> shop? Um, what attracted you to playing the blues? It was just a feeling. I've been, I've been listening to it since I was a kid and, right. yeah, it was just something about the feeling, I don't know, the soul. It, it just it, captured Well, me. it is because everybody sort of really, you mm. watch an audience and they're all doing this yeah. or they're doing something with their hand, you know, to the rhythm that's mm. happening. It or does, the hips or the hips. You know. well, well, yes, or the <laughs> hips if you're standing on the floor. Well, maybe even if you're sitting down. <laughs> but, but it does. It definitely has something that captures the human soul mm -hmm. in some yeah. way. Mm. But... Really, one of the things that's really valuable that you've done is look at the next generation of blues players. Mm. And you've come up with this idea that has worked for you for the last few years. Just explain what that is. Yeah, so the Adelaide Roots and Blues Association, who, who we've been asso associated with, uh, have uh, been supporting the blues music and, and blues musicians uh, throughout South Australia. But one thing that they really wanted to do was do something for young people mm -hmm. and uh, well, without young people coming into the music area mm. it ain't gonna last mm. exactly and using the blues terminology it ain't yeah exactly right you know and back in the day of course um, there would be the university of the blues which was basically the clubs yes. you know and and young inspiring musicians would just be hanging around these these yep. places and and juke joints and and all of this and they would grow up with it and they would be connected with the the artists that had come before them these days things are not quite as connected i mean we are in a way even more connected but you know to be oh, able it's to the human experience of being together yeah. and doing exactly what yeah. we were just yeah. saying you know yeah being everybody's part of that music experience yeah. for that yeah. moment yeah and so we were we've been very fortunate to be involved in organising a uh, Youth in Blues program for the last five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure how many uh, alumni we've, we've brought through the program, but it's... it's It'd be probably about 80. Yeah. About 80 kids have come through. Well, and, yeah. and you playing guitar, I mean, mm. it's not a, a... Ideally, it's not just a male's instrument, mm. but you must inspire a lot of girls to have a look at that. As, a, well, as, you know, yeah. something to play. I don't know. I, I definitely 
I just do it because I love it. And sure. I just hope that that example just empowers people to say, if something, you know, draws on your heartstrings, go for it. Mm. And that's just all I hope. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So where are, where are the, should we call them students? Where are the mm. students coming from? Are they coming from the music departments in high schools? And what age group are you looking at? Yeah, so the, the, they're coming from they're bas basically the teenage years yep. right up through till about 22. So you'd say that they're coming from high schools or colleges? High schools, uh, some from, from colleges mm -hmm. and, uh, and really from all over South Australia, but mainly around the, the Adelaide area, of right. course. Mm. So the incentive really is to find the kids that have got this desire to learn more mm -hmm. about how the blues works, how the structure of the music mm. works. Uh, you're not teaching them to play the instrument because they've mm. already got there. Mm. That's right, yeah. So what happens, just explain the procedure, how they get to what it, it is going to end up a performance, a live performance. Mm. So we, the, the program's made up of two components. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, there's the opportunity to actually play in a band. Yep. To meet and, and get... You may not be in a band already, but there's yeah. going to be a whole group of people yeah, that are making Yeah, that's right. That. So we put all the, the, uh, the, the kids into, into bands and then we rehearse them for, uh, for four rehearsals to prepare them for a concert. Mm -hmm. And uh, in amongst the rehearsals, we also have a number of master classes. We bring in mentors, um, experienced blues musicians of, of all ages, really. We've got, you know, some guys that have been around the scene for years, and then we've got some other um, young people that are, are, are seriously good professional musicians. But, you know, the kids are able to access these people. Mm. But not just that, they get to spend time with other kids that, you know, they have the same interests. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's finding your tribe, isn't it? it, it mm. I often say yes. that to kids. It's mm. when they enter any of the art forms, you're obviously going to find your tribe, other people that feel just like you do about how you feel. Mm, exactly. And the joy that it brings and then the joy of the friendship together that mm. it brings. Mm. Okay, so this is, so the classes are in the process of happening right now mm -hmm. um, and they culminate in a performance on... Yes, so the, the performance is happening in 30th the October. 30th of October. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually part of the back-to-back -back short show festival, mm -hmm. um, which is happening right here in Adelaide mm -hmm. uh, at the Star Theatre. And, and, you know, it's just to, to have this music in a beautiful theatre with all that vibe and to give the kids the opportunity to, to be on a big stage with full production. And work with professional people, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Just hold that thought. Mm -hmm. And we'll be back to talk a little bit more about this incentive and the results of, and we'll show you some of the results in just a tick. And welcome back to our time. Our guests are Evan Wetter and Erica Graff, and we're talking about the Youth in Blues program. So we've got some clips here to show everybody. Let's have a look at the first one because this is a group a band that's been put together of guys mm. who came along to the workshops, yep. had some coaching and some information uh, with a girl singer. And you can see the age group of the, the players, the other musicians there, and the makeup of that particular band. Is it usually sort of a guitar band? Well, it's interesting. This was a band that, that I mentored, and uh, it's piano, guitar, uh, bass and drums. Guitar is the, probably the most popular instrument, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, having a, a great mix. We've had horn players over the years and uh, harmonica players. So yeah, just all of the instruments that really are uh, involved in blues music. Right. And um, we've got another clip here of some girls performing. Uh, what was the story with this one? Well, this is, this is our, one of our youngest groups. They're actually all about 12 years old and only just getting into high school. Um, some of them have been involved in the program since the beginning. And it's, it's the first time they've played in a band. So they've come along, they've never played in a band. Um, they're extremely brave. <laughs> they're, they're giving something a crack and they don't necessarily know really what blues is. They might know a little bit, I've heard a little mm -hmm. bit here and there, but they, 
they they get a real education on what it's about and they discover something new and I always find them becoming very excited about this type of music and realising, hey, I can do this. And I, I recognise this sound because, you know, um, a lot of blues music, you know, has led its way into rock music. So they yeah. start to make this connection from the music they might hear now. It's like, oh, I recognise that sound. Is yeah, that how you do that? I get that, yeah. And, and yeah. you can hear that in so many things, yeah. particularly with guitar. Yeah. Because yeah. cause when guys are just sort of making up the solo, yeah. uh, or well, girls too for that matter, in a way it's often blues that they're playing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. To, to a rhythm that isn't necessarily the chunka 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 rhythm. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> you actually do that quite well. What, the chunka yeah, chunka chunka? Yeah, you've got, got, oh, got, got it. You've got it. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. The things you've done in your lifetime. <laughs> and actually that's one of the interesting things about that. It's like uh, with this other clip of the, the boy playing the harmonica. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting that feeling, I suppose, the feeling yep. in the that's coming out of your head, out of your heart, mm. as you're sort of grooving with the music. Mm, yeah, well, and this is actually really at the core of mm. blues, isn't it? It's about the feelings, you know, the fear. Mm. It, it's sort of, it's, it's so strange that, that what people identify as sad music literally makes you feel so good. Mm. And I think it's because it connects you to that human experience which we all have in common, you know, and... Uh, the rhythm, yeah. I think, too. It's that rhythm. It's it, it's sort of that... It's a heartbeat rhythm. Mm. Yes. Sort of. Yeah. Anything that's got a heartbeat seems to really connect to the soul yeah. sort of thing. Oh. Do you, is, is that what... Is that just me? No, look, no, I, I think agree. Like that, yeah. and, and I think, like, I, I was playing acid jazz before I, I got really immersed in the Acid rhythm. jazz. And we could clear a room in, in you know, minutes. <laughs> but when we, when we, and my true love, it was always the blues. And mm -hmm. when, when we started playing the blues, you just could see the difference. People are just connected. And like I said, it's, you feel it in the hips, you feel it in the soul. Mm. People are moving, people connect with it. And then of course, uh, pretty well all of popular music uh, comes from the blues. So, you know, it's... Yeah. Well, when you think of it, country music has got that sort of feel to it. Mm, a lot of the country yeah. songs are bluesy type. That's right. You know, the subject material, I lost my love yeah. and <laughs> now I'm desperate. They're cousins, aren't they? <laughs> They're blues cousins. And, and country. Well, yeah. and again, I suppose, and that, that dovetails nicely into some of the jazz, the slower jazz music particularly mm. too, because again, there's improvisation with it. So mm. you are actually working off your soul all the time. Mm. Yeah. So just talk us through again. So anybody that's already playing, who knows their instrument mm -hmm. well enough mm -hmm. and who wants to go down this path can find information. Yeah. Yeah. And it's called Youth in Blues. Youth in mm. Blues. You've got right? Adelaide Roots and Blues Association. Um, you'll find your way through to the Youth in Blues program. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, I would suggest that if you're really keen on playing a, an instrument, even if that's not your particular choice of music to play, a great experience to work with some true pros that can give you and broaden your uh, musical knowledge and appreciation of what music can do for you. Exactly. And good luck with the band, Lazy Eye. Thank you. And good luck with this, with the Back to Back Festival. Thank you very much. And we'll be back in just a little while to meet a young man with the name of Jackson Joy. Our next guest on our time is Jackson Joy. Welcome, Jackson. It's <laughs> lovely to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. But it's also good to have somebody of your age and experience on the program, but with a really interesting story. We're, we're going to talk about a show that you've developed, but first of all, let's talk about when you found out or well, when you were diagnosed with Asperger's. So, anything? <laughs> well, did you know what that meant? Did your parents know what that meant? Uh, I was diagnosed at the age of seven, I was in year two, and to be honest, the only thing I remember about when I was diagnosed was my parents sat me on my bed one night and handed me a book and said, here, have a read if you want. And it was all about, um, I think it was explain, explaining Asperger's and autism to kids, and I remember right. going into school the next day, or the next time I was able to, um, and we sat down and my... Uh, this year I had my favourite teacher in year two and she sat everyone down and said, right, this is who someone is in our class. Have you got any questions? And they all asked me questions, which was 
quite odd as a seven-year-old in year two, but... <laughs> Suddenly you're an expert. Yes, apparently. Yeah, without even knowing. So how did this manifest itself in your life? Um... Well, like, did you have difficulty making friendships? Did people understand the way you thought? Oh, absolutely. There was, I believe, in from the age of probably three or four, I was really, you know how when you get older, like when it would have come out in the 70s, everyone loves Star Wars, as right. you can see. Oh, um, yes, oh, I see, yes. As they would have loved Star Wars and been so enveloped in it, I may have been the same with uh, Thomas the Tank Engine. Okay. And but you're now Star Wars. Oh, now Star Wars, now absolutely. Star Wars, yes, yes. Um, and one of the main things that's seen within young children is lining up, and I would always have all my trains lined up. I wouldn't be playing with them on a wooden railway. I'd have them lined up in order, and I'd name each one of them. Right. So, so it's more or less a pedantic way of looking at things in life? Is that how you could oh, describe it? I wouldn't it? say pedantic. It's a more... Uh, another P word I would use is peculiar. It's okay. um, perhaps something as simple as making a great analogy that I've heard from someone else with Asperger's is making bread. You can't just, or making a cake. You can't just go and bake a cake. Some people can. Some people will go, oh, I'm just going to go bake a cake. I can't just bake a cake. I'm going to have to get all the ingredients out. Then I'm going to have to do the dry ingredients. Then I'm going to have to do the wet ingredients. Oh, right. I'm going to have so to you've got to line everything up. Exactly. So, right. Okay. Yeah, that's pedantic. <laughs> when you put it like that, yes. Yeah, well, no, no, no. But you know, we don't. Uh, often we don't talk about these things. No. They, we say the word, and people really don't understand what it actually means. But generally, did you have issues with making friends? Did people understand why you wanted to line everything up? Oh, I had. I want to say about three friends from year, from reception to year five. I had three okay. friends. Um, did they all have Asperger's too? Wouldn't surprise me if one of them did, but I know two of them did not. Yeah, okay. Um, they were but, just nice blokes. Oh, they were just exceptionally friendly people. And I still keep in touch with them today, or one of them. <laughs> well, well, that's part of that is actually part of making friends. I think you, yeah, you do have friends that you make when you're a kid, and it goes through the rest of your life. Mm. Now, but for you. Um, music, you suddenly found a home with music and singing. Oh, absolutely. Just in, explain that. In 2017, an opportunity came up. Before that, I had been doing dance and I started doing this music theatre class and then 2017, uh, opportunity to audition for a production of Singing in the Rain Junior came up. Mm -hmm. My cousin was going to do it and so I went, why not? I'll give it a shot. I got in, I, was, I found in that year and talking back with the director, I'm doing a show with her at the moment, um, I was really closed up and I would go and I'd sit in the corner on my phone because okay. at that age I was just given a phone. Um, <laughs> you suddenly discovered the wonders of the world. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Um, and after doing that show, I went back and did another show with them. I did Little Shop of Horrors and got a bit of a bigger role and from there I just met so many people and really found my niche in, well, the, the community of... Well, as we're talking, yeah, we're talking with the musicians before, finding your tribe. It's mm. really important to find your tribe. Absolutely. And as a teenager, even more so, I think, that you mm. can find people that you can not only have a friendship with but share an actual life experience, like doing a show. Yeah. So how did you become interested in the music of Stephen Sondheim? Because that's the music you're using in the show that you're doing. Yes, so... Um was the first I think the first instance that really drew me to Stephen Sondheim wasn't even Sondheim himself. It was James Lapine and his work on falsettos, falsetto land, all those little uh, three-part mini opera as it really was. Mm -hmm. um, and I then went on and looked into Into the Woods and slowly explored that larger area of older theatre. And I found Stephen Sondheim and something just clicked with me and his music. I was, I've been doing singing lessons with the wonderful David Gauchy over mm -hmm. the last few years and we've come across Sondheim pieces and I found them so much easier to understand than regular pieces. Do you, think, do you pieces. think Stephen Sondheim maybe has Asperger's as well? It, I, would, Asperger's? I would say it's without a doubt. I've looked into, for some studies at school, I've looked into Stephen Sondheim 
while he was still learning and while he was developing his first few shows. And there are certainly aspects of um, neurodivergency as it's now mm -hmm. um, sort of under the banner. Yeah. Um, there's certainly aspects of neurodivergency that you can see in his works. Well, he had so many layers too, oh, didn't yes. he? Particularly in the vocals. There was, you know, people singing over people singing over just people a few. singing. Yep. Just yeah. a few people singing over a few people over a few people. <laughs> exactly. Um, so talk about your show. How did you, is this a story of your life that you've put together so far or is it a story of his music? So Sondheim and Me is a, I used. That's the name of the that's show. That's the name of the show, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I did Class of Cabaret last year. Okay, so for people who don't know what that is in South Australia, this is the Cabaret Festival, which yep. is now a worldwide uh, acknowledged cabaret festival. Oh, yeah. People literally come from everywhere. And one of the wise things that was set up um, by the man who set all this up was to uh, have a, a show called The Class of Cabaret where kids who were studying anything that had to do with music or cabaret performance could come together into a big group show. Is that mm. correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, I did that last year and I wrote this seven-minute set to Mel Brooks' High Anxiety um, <laughs> on how I think normally, especially in that pedantic way. Um, and one, per one of our mentors just kept saying, you need to make a full show, you need to make a full show. Um, and I was listening to the music of Stephen Sondheim and I was having a few ideas here and there. And then I blabbered onto a page and made what I could out of that. Good on you. See, this is what, talking about the Youth in Blues program before, this is what we really need as a society. We need people that are young in your age group starting to write your own stuff or develop your own stuff because otherwise we're just going to be repeating American shows forever. Oh, absolutely. And we're not going to get that personal touch that touches people that feel like you or to explain to people who don't feel like you how you feel. What advice would you give to somebody who doesn't really understand what Asperger's is? Like, do you have a sense of humour? Oh, um, I would like to say I have a sense of humour. Um, for those who don't understand it and are not under the banner, it's really about accepting those who are under the banner and how they act and how they think and just being there as support for those who are under the banner and don't understand it. Um, you'd certainly, you'd be able to look into it. But see, there's nothing wrong with having Asperger's. No, I think absolutely the most important not. thing is we've probably all got different shades of whatever we are and we all come together to make up a fascinating society. Absolutely. And what Asperger's gives people are different ways of looking at things. Do you feel you have a different way of looking at things? Oh, absolutely. But do you know what is a normal, what, what's normal anyway, but what's a normal way of looking at things? What's your way of looking at things? But these are the things that bring us together as humans. Yeah. Because... It's challenging. Oh, he said that, he thought that, you know, and then that makes you think, oh, should I think like that or should I think like that? I think it's a... How I understand it is that um, perhaps those of a neurotypical sense would think, OK, this is A, B and C. Those of a neurodivergent sense may think, this is A, this is step one, two and three within A, this is B, this is step one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six in B, and then C is going to be a combination of A and B and we're going to have a few more steps in there. Brilliant. Oh, uh, look, uh, best of luck with your show. When's Thank it you. on? Uh, it is on at uh, the Back to Back Short Festival um, on October the 22nd okay. and the 29th. You're doing a couple of shows. Yes. Well, good luck with that. And thanks to Evan and to Erica and good luck for the shows that they're about to perform. So until next time on our time, keep yourself nice till then. Bye. <laughs>